Hi and welcome to another narration presented by yours truly, Cryptid's Roost. Let's just take a moment silence for all the haters, Karens and the trolls, that's enough. Be sure to check out the blooper reel at the end of the video, which is then followed by the end screen where you will find more videos listed. So grab your coffee, sit back and enjoy the show. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. Night of the Knuckle Biters Halloween Special This awesome story is written by Corpse Child. Psychotoxin Press is a newly fledged horror publishing house where Corpse Child is both the co-founder as well as the in-house author and artist. They have just released their very first quarterly magazine, Eidetic Quarterly Part 1. Be sure to check it out, link is below. Full moon, flashing lights, loud ass music, beer, pot and the hottest girls on campus. Every college boy's dream, right? That was the Knuckle Biters Empire Halloween party. This was all of course Ronnie's idea. Ronald Edmonds, Knucklebiter Supreme and ruler of parties and chicks. In case you haven't picked up on it yet, yes, we're a bunch of dumbass frat boys. Parties once a month and football games every Friday night during the winter. Me, Ronnie, Zach and Wydell were about the most obnoxious frat on campus at Western State University and we couldn't have cared less. When we weren't at football games like I mentioned, ogling the cheerleaders or trying to and usually failing to score with the chicks at Ronnie's house parties, we were usually spending our time coming up with the most extreme stunts and pranks to pull off on the campus. And when I say extreme, we're not just talking simple spray painting suck it on the Dean's car. Though we did do that once or hooking up a car battery to the seat in one of the bathrooms so the nest and lucky son of a bitch would be on the hot seat when he needed to drop one. No, we're talking more like actually filling up and attempting to light off a potpourri of firecrackers under the trunk of Wydell's old piece of shit Ford pickup that was constantly breaking down every two times you went to turn the damn thing on and watching it go out with a blast on the campus football field. Either that or at the very least trying to dare random people to run across campus in broad daylight bare assed with lit sparklers in the hands shouting long live knuckle biter supreme. Yes we were idiots and yes we probably should have been arrested a few times. To answer as to why we hadn't ever been, since I know you're wondering, well, let me emphasize the word attempt. See, the downside was, next to none of these stunts actually working like we wanted them to, people of course weren't interested in making a quick 20 bucks by running across campus in the buff, and the one time we actually tried the car bomb on the soccer field act the damn things were fucking duds. In short, we were wannabe hotshots even if we couldn't ever pull off half the insane and dangerous shit we came up with on the regular. I know that was kind of a lot, but now you know who we were and why this whole mess has turned things every which way from loose for me. So anyway, like I said, we were at Ronnie's party me and Zach were both nice and stoned with the bowl he brought while watching Wydell dance, or at least tried to, in the middle of the living room with a few of the girls, while Ronnie was in the kitchen nursing his high with as much of the chips and junk food as he could stuff in his mouth. As the two of us watched, Zach turned to me and said, God man, just imagine. What dude? I asked. He pointed to the girls gathered around Wydell. 
Imagine yourself right there with all of them rubbing up against you like that. I looked and snickered. Yeah. Hey, Wydell, backroom's all yours, he called out. Wydell glared at him, still continuing to do his little shaking thing that I guess was supposed to count as him dancing. I think he was actually about to stop and walk off to somewhere else when one of the girls, an albeit drop dead gorgeous babe that had both mine and Zack's eyes bulging from their sockets, stopped him. She was tall, meeting Wydell, who was the tallest of us knuckle biters, at six foot, at eye level. She was slim too, forming an almost perfect hourglass shape from shoulders to her hips. Wydell was thinking the same thing too, judging from the way in which his eyes were about to shoot out of his own head. She winked, bit her lip and playfully took his hand, gesturing to the back bedroom of Ronnie's house. Wydell stood still, looking caught off guard. I, being the good old pal I was, decided to egg him on, going, Wydell! 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 Soon, Zack and a few of the others around him joined in. He looked absolutely embarrassed and it was hilarious. Of course, I couldn't blame him. Of the four of us, Wydell was always the one we'd expect to always strike out with the ladies. I mean, none of us were real top-notch catches as far as that went, I'll admit. But Wydell had always been the responsible, or at least the most responsible knuckle biter. It was at least 51% of the reason we had him hanging out with us. While the other three of us were doing shit that'd get us, and probably others if we're being honest, killed. Wydell would be the one that'd be there so that we'd have at least a slight chance of surviving whatever stupid stunt we were trying to pull off at any given moment. Funny how that works, I guess. Well, anyway, there he was, presented with this golden opportunity. And what does he do? He stands there, jaw hanging open like an idiot. A few other girls, all just as hot as the one in front of him, then come up and take his other hand with sly smiles of their own. Eventually, they managed to coax him to move and they led him all the way to the back room. Atta boy! Get him, why guy! I shouted. I heard the door close and everyone turned down the music and tried to listen closely. We couldn't hear anything. We figured, you know, he's probably nervous. Like I said, it was his first time. Eventually though, interest in this started to fade after about five or so minutes with absolutely nothing happening. And the music was turned back up. Another 10 or 20 minutes went by before Ronnie came back into the living room. Hey, what's going on? I missed something. Zack and I grinned. Bro, you missed Wydell scoring with chicks, I exclaimed. His eyes grew. You're bullshitting. No, dude, Zack said. Ask anyone here, they'll tell you. He looked around at the crowd and back to the two of us. You'd be proud. Who was it? He asked, still looking sceptical. I shrugged. Don't know. It was this really cute chick and a couple of her friends. I haven't ever seen them before. I don't even think they're actually from the campus. His eyes got even bigger with shock. Friends? He exclaimed. You mean to tell me he actually landed more than one at the same time? Zack and I both nodded, grinning excitedly. He stared in shock for another moment before his face fell into one of outrage. Hold up! You mean to tell me that fucker's getting it on before I have my turn? The fuck? Oh, lighten up, dude, Zack chided. 
You've had all this time to have your shot and you decided to pig out in the kitchen. I shrugged in agreement and told him, You stay quiet, you bite it. It was our little credo. It was supposed to mean something similar to YOLO, you know? You get one shot, you better take it, basically. Of course, this didn't mean shit to him. That was always a big sort of unspoken rule between the knucklebiter empire when it came to parties. We could have as much fun with whatever girl we managed to get lucky with that night in the back room for however long we liked, so long as he got the first session. It was sort of our little bro code type thing, even if we weren't exactly big on the idea. We didn't usually oppose it, but I figured, like Zack said, he'd had all that time, plus it was Weidel's first ever. You'd think he'd have been willing to cut a little slack, right? Ronnie started stomping off towards the back room. Zack and I braced ourselves to have to hear him scream at the top of his lungs at Weidel. We heard him shout, what the fuck? I could tell something was off though. Oh God, what the fuck? Zack and I looked at each other alarmed before jumping up from the couch and running for the back room. Zack reached the room ahead of me. Dude, what's wrong? Oh my God. I made it the rest of the way to the room and instantly felt sick to my stomach. The bed was torn and cut up, every inch covered in rips and slashes. Also covered in these, from head to toe, almost to the point where I couldn't even recognize him, was Wydell, who was gasping and wheezing, even coughing up spurts of blood. On the wall, as well as on his chest and both his palms, was a pentagram. Wydell! I cried pushing past the other two and rushing over to the bed. Zack turned and retched while Ronnie just stood frozen in the doorway. Wydell weakly spasmed while spitting out bigger and bigger spurts of blood. Why? Stay with me, man! I turned to the others and shouted, What the fuck are you standing there for? Go! Get 911 on the phone! We can't, dude, Ronnie exclaimed. What do you mean, we can't? Dude, are you trying to get us busted? He held up the joint he had behind his ear. He's gonna fucking die if we don't. He still remained stiff. Dude, trust me, this is a hell of a lot worse than a fucking possession charge. Get the ambulance on the phone, now! I stared wildly at him, making it clear that I was going to put my foot in his ass if he didn't. Reluctantly, yet desperately, he ran back into the living room to call 911, while also clearing out the rest of the guests. Zack, grab me a towel! He ran to the bathroom and came back with an old, dirty towel. Here, help me plug his wound. Which one? he asked. I looked around. I almost wasn't sure, given how much his body had been ripped up. Finally, I told him to wrap it around the pentagram on his chest. I carefully then tried performing CPR. I didn't know what else to do, besides that and trying to prop his head up. Never really had much knowledge of first aid. Sure enough, this at least got him to stop coughing up blood. He continued wheezing. What happened, dude? Zack asked Wydell, as if he was going to actually be able to answer that. Wydell gasped harder and harder, like he was actually trying to speak. Nothing came out, though. Ronnie came running back into the room. Okay, they're on their way. Is he going to be? Don't know yet. Is everyone else gone? Yeah. 
Wido's body began to relax and his eyes started to glaze over with his head lolling limply to one side. Why? I said, shaking him gently. Wido, come on man, stay with me. I could feel his chest relaxing under my hands. He wasn't going to make it much longer. I started shaking him harder. Wydell! Wydell! I then resulted again the chest compressions, stopping every 10 to 15 seconds to give him mouth to mouth. Nothing seemed to be working. His heartbeat was so faint by that point that I almost didn't feel it, despite how hard I was pressing. In what I considered to be a true stroke of luck, almost even the work of a miracle, I heard the sirens outside. That's them, Ronnie said. I'll let them in. He and Zach then rushed out to the room into the living room, leaving me alone with a rapidly fading wide L. Ten seconds later, paramedics flooded the room and told me they'd handle it from there. I was led out to the room while they started trying to prep him to be moved. My mind was wrecked, to say the least. I mean, one moment, shit's fine and dandy. My friend's about to get his first lucky night with a couple of hot chicks, and just 15 or 20 minutes later, he was choking on his own blood after having been mauled by what must have been a big ass wolverine or something. This alone was enough to put me into a frenzy, obviously, but what struck out to me even more were of course the pentagrams. Now I'm no kind of religious nut by any stretch, I grew up atheist, but I wasn't born yesterday. I'd seen shit like this both online and on TV. I knew what a human sacrifice looked like. Not only this, but I also saw the window wide open in the room while I was trying to revive Wydell. One thing I knew for a fact was that Ronnie never opened that window, usually so he could keep the weed fumes contained whenever he was having one of his turns with the back room, and because I also knew no one was in there at the time. I knew this had to do with those girls. They did that to him and then fled out the window, disappearing into the night. That much was certain to me, even then, with my brain scrambling worse than a pan of eggs. What wasn't making sense to me was why, and or even how. Okay, so maybe the chicks were part of some crazy murder cult or something. Again, that had maybe explained the pentagrams, but even still though, how the hell could they have done that to him? Wydell was then rushed off to the hospital as police then arrived at the house. The rest of that night was spent being interrogated by the police. We tried telling them the same thing I've been saying here, that we don't know shit about what went on in that room, but it was still another four or five hours of them assaulting us with questions before they finally let us go home. Zack, Ronnie and I split up from there, with them, at least I assume, going back to the campus while I decided to head to the hospital to check up on Wydell. Admittedly, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to expect, other than to hear that he didn't even make it there. I guess it was relief then that I stood corrected when they told me he'd actually stabilised. The doctors told me he was asleep and had been for the past three hours. We almost lost him, the doctor added, chuckling dryly. But whatever your boy's on, it's some powerful stuff. What do you mean? I asked him. Well, you saw him, right? Losing as much blood as he did, plus several slashed tendons and even one or two slashed arteries. He should have bit it before we could even get him on the table, but he's still kicking, sleeping now like a baby. He chuckled again when he said this, 
I stared confused at him. Sorry? Wasn't meaning any disrespect, just astonished by it, that's all. Yeah, okay, whatever. Can I see him? He looked at his watch. Afraid not, pal, he said, looking up at me, tapping his watch. Come back in about six hours. With that, I turned and left back towards the campus. On the way back, I texted Ronnie and Zach, telling them Wydell had made it and it was okay. Ronnie texted back. Thank God. What do you think could have happened? I texted back, telling him, fuck if I knew. You must have really wanted it rough, huh? Dude, what the fuck? Our boy is put in the hospital and you're making jokes. No man, I told you, I've never seen them before. I don't think they're even from the college. Then how they find my place? I mean, you know our Halloween party was invite only, right? I stopped. There was another enigma, one I never even considered before then. He was right. We, or at least me and Ronnie, had only told a select few people that we were even having that party at his house that night. And whoever we did allow on the guest list, we made sure all four of us knew about it. We also explicitly stated the whole invite only thing to the guests, meaning that they weren't allowed to bring anyone else in on it either. Well, again, that's how me and Ronnie did anyways. That led me to wonder then, who, if not me or Ronnie, knew them and invited them? The only options were either A, Wydell himself, or B, Zack. I told this to Ronnie. I doubt Zack would have known. I'll ask him though. After that, I drove back the rest of the way to the campus and headed back to my dorm, where I crashed out of sheer exhaustion. Despite this though, I didn't sleep well. I couldn't get the image out of my head of seeing Wydell splayed out across Ronnie's bed like that, all hacked up with pentagrams all over him. I woke up around 8 that morning though, to a flood of texts from Ronnie. Dude, look at this shit! Following this was a Google link to a news article on YouTube as well as about five or six different screenshots. Each one was of the hospital. One or two of them looked like the inside of some of the rooms all torn apart. Stuff having been thrown all over the place like a tornado had swept through, while others were of actual people having been torn apart. Some of them didn't even have much left of them anymore looking like hunks of bloody meat and bones scattered across the floor. Dude, when was this taken? This morning, dude. Have you seen the footage yet? I responded that I hadn't and clicked the video. Footage of the hospital from the photos appeared with the headlines reading Brutal Violence in Hospital at Late Hours of the Night. It went on to show similar pictures inside the hospital along with people, patients and nurses alike being wheeled out of the place. Seeing the place from the inside, I realised it was the hospital Wydell was in. This put me on edge, causing me to spend the entire video tensely waiting for it to be revealed that Wydell had been mutilated again, along with the others. A woman then came on screen. The screen transitioned then to a walk inside the hospital. I saw large scratches running across the length of both the floor and the walls. Authorities claim to have arrived to what they described to be a madhouse, with hordes of people coming out of the hospital for their lives. Police officer Gordon LeVay is quoted in saying that the situation was nothing short of utter chaos. 
It then cut to the officer. It was wild, he said. We pull up and we couldn't even get into the parking lot because people were scattered all over the place. It took us almost 20 minutes to be able to calm enough people down to even get into the parking lot. It cut back to the reporter. When asked what happened inside, this is what Officer LeVay had to say. It cut back to Officer LeVay. When we could finally get someone to calm down long enough to even talk to us, the most consistent detail we could make out was that something about a monster rampaging through the place. We sent a unit in and things just went down from there. The footage then cut back to the hospital with a recording that played of the radio communications. For about the first minute or so, it was typical back and forth chatter between inside and outside units. Suddenly though, I could hear the inside unit starting to panic as growling noises picked up in the distance. From there, it devolved into chaos with the inside crew shouting frantically for backup and firing their guns in a frenzy and ground crew trying to discern what was going on. The chaos escalated when just about all I could hear from the inside unit's side was screams of pain and the growling turning into straight up roaring. Hearing this made my blood freeze solid. My body was stiff. I couldn't even move my eyelids to blink. I just stared slack-jawed at my phone screen as the reporter went on to say that no suspects, human or otherwise, were detained and that investigation into the situation was ongoing. Of course, this brought me no comfort. All I could do was wonder what the hell that growling in the background was coming from. What the hell had all the cops thrown into a panic like that? and what caused the destruction of the hospital like what was shown. This and what the hell happened to my friend in there. Was he okay? Immediately after the news clip ended, I texted Ronnie back, telling him I'd watched the news clip. Yeah, I heard it. Sounded like a dog or something. A big ass dog. A dog? What dog would be big enough to do all that? Destroying the place like that? I don't know man. Shit, that's just what it sounded like to me. I mean, it's obvious whatever the fucking thing was, wasn't a person. What the hell you asking me for? You knew about this before I did. Yeah, but you were there last night, weren't you? I stopped. He was right again. I was there only hours before this all took place. Everything was fine, both when I arrived and when I left. But then, where did this thing come from? And how did I or nobody else see it? Yeah. I was. And you didn't see any quote unquote big ass dogs there, did you? No, you're right. I didn't see anything like that. What about our boy? Why? You think he's okay? My heart went into a frenzy. I don't know, dude. He was out cold when I left the hospital. Doc say he pulled through by a miracle when I got there. They wouldn't let me see him though. I was going to try and talk to him today. Fat chance of that. Yeah, well, hey, you talked to Zach yet? Ask him if he knew the girls from the party last night and how they showed up? Yeah, he swears up and down that he's never seen him before in his life before the party. And I believe him like I believe you. Yeah, but then... How could they have known then? Dude, you don't think maybe... What? That maybe Wydell might have invited them, do you? 
Serious? Weidel? I'd sooner believe it was you that did it before him. Besides, why would he invite chicks over just to mutilate him like that? Well, I mean, if he did know them, I doubt it was because he wanted to get freaky with them like that. Hell, you saw the pentagrams, right? A cult shit, you know? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. You think that's why they were at the party? To perform some sort of human sacrifice? Possible. Why Weidel though? I don't know man. Hell, all I know is I didn't invite them. You didn't invite them. And Zack didn't either. That would have had to leave him. And now there's whatever the hell this thing on the news was. I know man. She's got me all screwed up in all kinds of different ways. Look man, I gotta go now, gotta get ready for class. It's Professor Rathbone's class today too. Fuck me. Okay, let me know if something else fucked up happens without me noticing, okay? Got it. Also, see if you can talk to Wydell, see how he's holding up and if he knows anything. I'll try dude, although I don't know how I'd be able to do that. Well, weren't the patients moved last night when they were evacuating? Yeah, so check out this general. If they moved them anywhere, he'd likely be there, right? Since he's about two or three blocks up from St. Leonard's. Okay, I'll try there after my 2.30 class. After that, the conversation ended and I looked at the clock. It was only 10.30. I decided to spend the rest of the time looking into both any possible satanic cults that might have been well known in the area, as well as asking, for good enough measure, a few of the approved VIPs for the party, if maybe one of them knew the girls and or might have decided to invite them against the rules. On that end, I got more or less the exact same answer that I gave to Ronnie that they'd never seen or spoke to either of the girls before the party that night. I didn't want to admit it, not at all, given what happened, but it looked like the only explanation for how those girls even showed up to begin with was that Weidel had been the one to invite them. Of course, I could see where Ronnie was coming from, that he likely wasn't aware of who they really were or what they apparently had planned for him. I mean, aren't the best serial killers the ones you can't just automatically look at and say, yeah, something's fucky with you sir. But even still, that begs the question of how he'd have even known them to begin with. Yeah, I keep harping on the fact that he'd always been the runt of the knuckle biter litter but only because it was, for most cases, true. He was always the level-headed one that could counterbalance the insanity of the rest of us three, you know? Before that night, the kid couldn't even land a date with a girl or get a phone number at one of our regular parties. But there he was that night at our Halloween invite-only party with two bombshells all over him, ready to take him to Pound Town. What happened in between? I'd have believed in it being a stroke of luck, or twist of fate, if it hadn't ended with him being flayed alive on my friend's bed like that. Another thing that struck me out of nowhere, something I hadn't even considered before, now of course, I'm no kind of expert on witchcraft or black magic or any shit like that. I'm atheist, but why didn't they finish him that night on the bed? I mean sure, it wasn't exactly an isolated space surrounded by other people and it was considered a miracle he was supposedly alive when I went to the hospital that night. But I couldn't help but feel it wasn't really luck that pulled him through. Think about it for a second. 
there was at least a 15 minute gap between the time the girls led Wydell to the back bedroom and the time Ronnie found him and during that time no one saw or heard a damn thing. In other words there was far more than enough time for them to off him and make out the window like they did with no one to do anything about it. Yet he made it. I got just about the same results as far as trying to research any articles about satanic ritual murders in the area. Just as well I guess. Like I said they obviously know how to do this shit without getting caught. Then I decided to look into Wiccan rituals in general, specifically ones that pertained to live sacrifices. For the most part there weren't many, at least not with any detail that would have been connected to what happened with Wydell at the party. Then however I found something on a web page detailing the practice of practical lycanthropy. Skimming through the page I was able to spot some of the pictures of pentagrams being tattooed into people's palms, sort of like branding. Apparently this was a community type of thing too. People united under the belief of what they referred to as werewolf magic. Now I bet I know what you're thinking when you hear that. I get it. Trust me. I was too. However no, this apparently wasn't the practice of people actually transforming under the full moon or anything like that. At least not under normal circumstances with this practice. For the most part, people that practiced this were more into spiritually based transformations, unleashing your inner wolf as they frequently termed it. Like I said it looked relatively harmless, odd, sure, but nothing extreme like what happened. That was until I read a bit more into a bit of the culture's history. Apparently around the 60s and 70s there was a massive growing panic about stuff like that, occult shit. Similar to the Salem witch hunts, apparently people carried a growing panic about werewolves. From what little bit I'd read, apparently one of the supposed werewolf cults, as the post referred to them as, was a cut above the rest in terms of putting their practices into motion. In other words, like what you're probably expecting here, this particular cult was less interested in connections with nature or becoming one with their animal spirits, and more interested in populating the earth with werewolves. When I tried to look though, the post didn't mention any of the cults or any members in specific by name. All that was there was a short blurb about their little master race of werewolves plan and how they apparently went underground almost entirely after supposedly causing such a panic, with thousands of people having been found mutilated almost beyond recognition. Though their method of introducing others into the fold was just as interesting. I read that this cult apparently observed a specific ritual where they fully embraced their bestial nature, embracing their rage and, and unbridled savagery and exact their brutality upon the new pledge until he or she is close to death, by which they will flee leaving the pledge to embrace their own savage nature in order to not only save themselves, but also integrate into their pack. I'll admit I was lost reading this. Keep in mind the normal practice of practical lycanthropy was an oddity to me. Now here I was reading some shit you'd expect to see in a shitty 80s movie. Yet how the hell was I supposed to deny it? As bad shit as any of this sounded to me, I couldn't lie and say it didn't add up. Wheels started turning as a chill crawled up and down my back. It was all coming together. The pentagrams, 
with the site listing the marks on the palms being a telltale sign of a werewolf practitioner. The fact that Wydell was still alive, despite major blood loss, and the fact that the girls had ample time to finish him off. And most of all, the way he was apparently recovering so quickly. What was that in the hospital? By that time, it was time for me to head into class. As you could imagine, I couldn't pay attention to a damn thing the professor was saying. Fortunately, I think it was only a review day anyway. Afterwards, I made a beeline for Ellis General Hospital. It was around 3.30 when I got there and I walked to the desk and asked the receptionist to see Wydell. Name? She asked, disinterested. Greg. Last name, too, sir. I sighed. I didn't have time for this. Dyers. Gregory Dyers. Wydell Lawrence is my friend and I want to check in on him. So can you please take me to him? She just gave me a blank look before rolling her eyes and typing on her keyboard. Let's see. Wydell Lawrence. You said his name was? I nodded. Yeah. Sorry, sir. I'm afraid we don't have anyone admitted here with the name Wydell Lawrence. My eyes went wide. What do you mean he isn't here? I exclaimed. She just shrugged, still giving me that annoyed look. Are you sure you checked through all the patient's names? She sighed and turned the computer monitor to face me. Look here. She pointed to a search bar and typed in Wydell's name. Nothing. If he was here, it would have shown up just now. Hate it for you, but your friend ain't here. I sighed exasperately. What was I supposed to do? If he wasn't there, then where was he? I even made the mistake of asking if patients from St. Leonard's had actually been admitted there after relocation. This earned me an annoyed groan and an exasperated yes. I left after that. On the way back to campus, I texted Ronnie telling him Wydell wasn't a Ellis General. Seriously? Yeah, and I don't know where else he'd be. You were right about that being where they moved the others from St. Leonard's, but not him. Well, the news did mention a lot of them didn't make it. You don't think? Actually, dude, I might have something even worse. I sent him the link to the post on practical lycanthropy and told him to read the section on the werewolf cults. About 10 to 20 minutes later, he texted back. Dude, WTF? What is this shit? Fucking werewolves? Yeah, I know it's weird, but read the part of the underground one, the one that apparently want to get others to join. Yeah, I saw that. Kinda of sick if you ask me. I rolled my eyes in annoyance. Really, Ronnie? You make jokes now? Dude, that's kind of fucked up, don't you think? Well, yeah. I mean, it's messed up, but still. Dude, I think that's what happened at the party last night. I think they performed this ritual on him and damn near killed him. Now he's missing and there's the incident at the hospital. Greg, man, are you seriously trying to tell me you think Wydell's a werewolf? No, I'm saying that our friend is now missing. Those freaky chicks are still out there and I don't know what's going on or where the hell to look for him. Okay, I'm headed back to campus now. After that, I continued down the highway until I spotted it out of the corner of my eye. It was two of the girls from the party. 
they were walking down the sidewalk laughing about something. Because I was so caught up with them, I almost didn't catch the fact that several cars in front of me had all of a sudden stopped at the red light. I ended up slamming on the brakes, narrowly avoiding rear-ending them. After catching my breath, I watched the girls continue walking into the nearby grove that was just a few miles out from the college. A thought occurred to me then, that must be their little meeting place. That must have been where they ran off to that night after attacking Wydell. Then I wondered what if they know where he was now. This in mind I decided to pull off and follow after them. Their pace was admittedly faster than I would have expected, but that also meant it would be easier for me to tell them without being seen. I followed them across the bridge and into the grove. They kept a steady pace ahead of me, just enough where I could still see them, but not enough for them to notice as long as they faced forward. They kept walking deeper and deeper. The further I went along, the more clustered I noticed the trees were, blocking off more and more of the light from bleeding into the grove. It got harder and harder to see both the girls as well as the actual road ahead of me. While I still had decent enough lighting, I pulled out my phone and snapped a picture of the two girls and sent them to Ronnie, telling him I'd found them and that I believed that they were hiding somewhere in the grove. I was shaken up from my phone, however, when I thought I saw a large shadow zip across the trees at the right of me. It was fast, and at first I thought it was simply a trick of the light or something. The girls were still directly ahead of me, slowly walking deeper and deeper until I could just barely even make out their outlines. Looking at the clock, I saw in panic that it was already getting on for 5.45. The sun would be going down soon, and with as much dark as it was already, it was going to be a pain in the ass to try and navigate without turning on my headlights. Thus giving myself away to the witch girls ahead of me. I had decided, having already snapped a photo of them in the grove to show to the police, to turn around and head back the rest of the way to campus, when this time from the left, up in the tree line, I saw a large shadow figure. I watched it bound from one tree to the next, beating down right at me with large burning yellow eyes. That thing wasn't just huge either, it was fast. It was keeping up with the car's pace effortlessly. I mean, yeah, I was keeping it relatively slow to begin with so I could track the girls, but even still this thing was easily keeping at least one tree ahead of the car. For a while I kept my focus fixed on it, continuing further into the grove. When I finally broke away though, and looked forward again, the girls were gone. In the split second this moment had to set in, the beast from the trees launched itself at the car, landing directly onto the hood and damn near flipping the car over. The whiplash caused me to end up bouncing my head off both the driver's side window and the steering wheel. Immediately my vision was so reduced to clouds and stars as I watched the beast then step down off the hood of the car. I couldn't see a thing of its face or anything else outside of its yellowed eyes. I heard it roar out before sending both of its boulder sized fists down to smash the hood of the car again. I was once again launched forward once again slamming my face into the steering wheel. Dazed, I saw the blurred form of the beast then rear back before sending its gigantic fist through the windshield, grabbing me tightly by the throat and hoisting me into the air. I could hear the thing snarling. I was only being held just inches away from its face that I vaguely made out the shape of its head to be that of a dog or a wolf. 
Oh Jesus, it's one of them. It's a fucking werewolf. The beast then chokeslammed me back down on the hood of my car, holding me there until my vision clouded over completely. I felt my flaming arms then begin to go limp. Soon I was out like a light. The last thing I could remember thinking was, please God, Ronnie, tell me you've called the cops and showed them that picture. To my absolute shock and amazement, I actually woke up again. I was groggy and my head throbbed and pounded. By that time, the sun was gone. Night had completely taken over, making seeing anything around me almost invisible. I tried to get up to move, only to find my wrists and ankles had been tied down. What in the heck? He's awake. I heard a soft voice say, giggling. I looked over to see the leader of the three girls standing over to the right of me. The other two were standing at my feet. Well, what the hell? I groaned, stirring. What is this? What the fuck's going on? One of the other two then squealed and said, I wanna do it. Patience? The main one chided. This is his night, remember? She looked behind the other towards the darkness of the rest of the grove. There, just barely silhouetted in the albeit pitiful rays of the moon, was the hulking behemoth that had had me only a moment ago. It stepped forward. I could hear his anger growling as it approached. Instantly, I set about trying to struggle against whatever it was I had been restrained to. It was no use though. I could feel whatever it was around my wrists and ankles painfully digging into them. I figured they must have used piano wire or something to tie me down where they did. Hey, let me go! What are you doing? What do you want from me? My mind and body both were locked in a frenzy. The main girl closest to me grinned deviously. Oh, he's scared. One of the other two squealed. The beast walked closer and closer. I could start to feel its hot, snarled breaths from about a foot away. I don't think he'd make a good addition to the pack. The other of the two said condescendingly. Enough! Main girl snapped. He will make a fine addition. He just needs to embrace, that's all, just like any of us. The other two nodded to her in agreement before looking back at me and grinning. E embrace? I exclaimed. But what? What are you talking about? What are you doing with me? The same as what we do for the world. Main girl said smoothly. What? The beast was leering over me now. We are setting the world free. Setting humanity free. Free? From what? From itself. You live in fear and in weakness. We are going to set the world free from this by adding the world of humanity. Raising up a new generation of the peoples much better, much more elevated than human beings. She slowly stepped away and the beast took another step towards me and began to reach down. I started to struggle again, trying to keep from being grabbed. When you remember the starving beast within you, you'll see then. You'll see what will happen for you like it did your friends here. My eyes grew at this. So, so it's true. It's actually fucking real. Wydell is a fucking werewolf. Uh, hey! What are you? I let out a cry of pain, cutting me off, when one of the beast's claws delivered a stinging slash across my cheek. 
It felt just like it'd been taken by a red hot fire poker across my face. Main girl chuckled. Only through pain and endurance will you be able to embrace the beast inside you. Following this, the next minute and a half was spent in the most agonizing pain I could ever feel in my entire life, in the past or in the future. The beast, Bidel, began to mercilessly hack, bite, slash and just mindlessly tear me open all across my body. My throat burned from how hard I was screaming. The only things I could hear over them besides Wydell's growls were the girls cackling. At one point I heard the main one say, Can you feel it? Can you feel the beast awakening inside you? Soon I felt my arms and legs start to go completely numb. My vision blurred once again and soon dark clouds formed across the outlines of my eyes. Wydell kept hacking and hacking away at me, ripping bigger and bigger gashes open all across my body. I was so weak by that point that I couldn't scream anymore, only let out a very weak groaning. Faintly I watched as the girls then approached Wydell from behind. Finally I watched as the girls then approached Wydell from behind and each drew a knife from their pockets. Main girl held up her hand to Wydell, stopping him mid-swipe. Enough, she said, coming closer to me with her knife. She approached me from her head while the other two gathered at either side of me. He must be marked for the pack if he is to join us. Then I watched her and the other two look up at the night sky. The full moon shone down upon the five of us in the grove, managing somehow to bleed all the way through the trees. That's when I watched the three of them begin to transform. They groaned and cried out in pain and adrenaline as I saw their bodies break and reshape themselves until they themselves were giant wolves like Wydell. Then the four of them were all leering down at me with yellow eyes. In unison the four of them raised up and howled at the moon. I was fading fast. I was already feeling myself slip in and out of consciousness. Then with two of the she-wolves at my right and left, <laughs> the main one in the centre at my feet alongside Wydell, I watched them plunge their knives down into both my hands and my chest and begin dragging the blades into the pattern of the pentagram. Despite being weak and my throat being shot all to hell from Wydell's assault, I couldn't hold back from letting out a shrill cry of pain as they slowly and agonizingly did this. When they finished they once again rose up and howled at the moon. By that point, pain, blood loss and just sheer exhaustion took effect over my body and I faded out completely. This time I was sure that would be game over for me. Unfortunately though, as I'd find out just a few hours later, it wasn't. When I woke up it was to bright fluorescent lights and the steady sound of an EKG monitor beeping. To my right was a tray of different surgical implements, some of them being caked in blood, indicating they'd been used while I was out. My head throbbed horribly and when I went to move I found my wrists to be strapped to the bed. Before I could panic wondering what the hell the deal was, the door to the room opened and a nurse walked in. Well, look who's awake, she said cheerfully, giving me an admittedly cute little smile. How are you feeling, hun? I groaned, like my head's in a freaking blender. She giggled. 
I tried to raise up my wrists where she could see, asking, Hey, uh, what's the deal with this? Her smile fell slightly. Well, she began, noticeably hesitant. See, when we brought you in, you were, well, let's just say you were restless. She chuckled awkwardly as she said this. Restless? I asked. She looked at me again, more noticeably a bit more anxious. What are you talking about? Restless? How? Hell, how did I even get here? Her eyes were fixed wide on me. You don't remember anything? I closed my eyes. But the last thing I could remember was the werewolves howling at the moon and carving the pentagrams into me. Of course, I couldn't exactly say that to her, could I? Instead, I told her that I just remembered going into the grove and blacking out after a big ass dog attacked me. A huge stretch of the truth, but at least a hell of a lot more believable, right? You don't remember anything after that? She asked nervously. No, I don't. What happened? Before she could go any further, the door opened again and two police officers walked in. Could we have a minute? One of them, a tall and extremely stocky one, I asked. The nurse nodded and got up to leave. He then turned to me and said, Gregory Dyers? He asked. I nodded. My name's Officer Cordell and this is my partner, Officer Tanner. Officer Tanner nodded to me, looking concentrated. Now, Greg, Officer Cordell went on. I can see you've been through quite a lot. He whistled. I take it whatever happened also probably screwed your head a bit loose as well. So I get you probably ain't gonna remember too much. So why don't you tell us what you do remember? I, I was following these girls into the grove. I stopped realizing how creepy that sounded. I looked at the officers. They seemed concentrated on my story. They were at a party at my friend's house the other night and attacked my friend, Wydell Lawrence. The two exchanged a look between each other before looking back to me. Go on, <laughs> Officer Cordell prompted. I was following them into the woods when this giant animal, I think it was a giant dog or something, came out from the trees and attacked me. So the dog did this? He pointed to the pentagrams. No, they did. The girls? I nodded. Was this before or after the dog attack? <laughs> Officer Tanner asked. After. Look, the dog or wolf or whatever it was attacked me and when I woke up, the girls had me tied down and were performing some sort of human sacrifice ritual or something. I swear that's all I remember. Look, I can prove it. Look at my foe. Officer Cordell raised his hands, cutting me off, saying, Whoa there, calm down. Your story's actually checked out so far. I raised my eyebrows. One of your little pals called in an anonymous tip about these three girls you're talking about, saying they were responsible for what happened to the Lawrence boy and that you tracked them into the grove. Nice one, by the way, but next time maybe don't try to do it alone, eh? Okay, but then why am I strapped to the bed? He exchanged another glance to Officer Tanner. Similar to the nervous glances the nurse had been giving me earlier. Well, like I said, we took your friend's tip and tracked you into the grove. When we did, at first you were out cold. I figured we were too late, as cut up as you were. Out of nowhere though, when ambulance tried moving you, you just up and went berserk. My eyes widened. But what do you mean by berserk? 
I mean berserk. You started growling, scratching, even bit a chunk out of two of the ambulances. Took me and two other officers just to hold you down long enough for one of them to hit you with some tranquilizer before they brought you here. My heart fell into my stomach. I looked at my palms again, seeing the pentagrams staring back up at me. Exact their brutality upon the new pledge until he or she is close to death, by which they will flee, leaving the pledge to embrace their own savage nature, in order to not only save themselves, but also integrate into their pack. No, 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 oh God. You okay there, son? Officer Cordell asked. I didn't answer. I just kept staring at my palms in horror. The officers then stood up and turned to leave. Officer Cordell placed a card on the table next to me. Give us a call if there's anything else you... Wait! I blurted. The girls! What happened with them? You guys caught them, right? Officer Cordell's face and sigh of disappointment gave me the answer. They were still out there. He told me they were going to continue scouring the grove looking for them, but that it wasn't entirely likely they'd find them there, knowing now the place would be under investigation. They left after that. This was yesterday. I've been here laid up at Ellis General since then. I haven't heard anything from Ronnie or Zack. They still don't even know about Wydell. They still think he's either missing or was killed in the attack at St. Leonard's. I'm not sure I could tell them the truth about it either. Like I said, I'm no kind of believer in spiritual transformation or whatever the hell it was called, but I know what I saw in the grove that night. What's worse? Now I'm one of them. They've taken me in as one of them now, just like they did with Wydell. I'm going to be a goddamn werewolf for the rest of my life. One night, a fucking Halloween party. Now I'm afraid of the night. God, I don't want it to turn night again. They've let me have my phone. Figured I can't really do much damage with that. Not with my hands strapped down while trying to hold it. I need help. I don't know what to do, other than whenever they finally release me from the hospital, I'm just going to get in my car and I'm going to drive as far away as absolutely possible. I want to be as far away as absolutely possible if I have to live this way. I'm just scared though that I won't make it that long. It'll be getting dark again soon, and I think the moon might still be full tonight. I hate to say it, but if that's the case, then I hope to God that these straps are tight enough. And I hope you enjoy the blooper reel. The three of us, me, Ronnie, Zach and Wydell, we're about the most obnoxious frat. The three of us, me, Ronnie, Zach and Wydell, were about the most obnoxious frat on campus at Western State University, and we couldn't have cared less. Danny, stop snoring. And the one time we actually tried the car bomb on the... Don't know. It was this really cute chick and a couple. You'd have had all this time to use. Zach and I braced ourselves to have. <coughs> His heartbeat was so faint. His heartbeat was so faint by the point. Fuck's sake. I knew this had to do with the, those girls. Fuck 
fucking hell. <sighs> then how'd they find my place? I mean, you know, our how- Fucking hell. To a flood of texts from Roddy. <clears throat> a search is claimed to have arrived soon. Okay, let me know if something else f On that end, I got more or less the exact same answers that I gave to Ronnie. That they'd never seen or spoke to either of the girls before that Motherfucker. <sighs> Skimming through the page, I was a. <laughs> I ended up slamming in the brakes. The girls were still directly ahead of me, slowly walking deeper and deeper until I could just barely even make out their head. Bloody dog, shut up. Stop snoring. I'm trying to record. No, I've lost my bloody pace. Dazed, I saw the blurred form of the beast that then roared back before. Dazed, I saw the blaze. Blur, 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 blur. Fucking hell. Dazed, I saw the blurred form of the beast. There, just barely silhouetted. I could feel. Oh, I lost my fucking place again. She slowly slept away. Idle kept hacking and hacking away at me, rippling. <coughs> Hey family, please be so kind as to throw punch the like button and smack the ass of the subscription button as well. And remember to choke hold that notification bell and then select all. That way you'll receive all notifications each time I upload a new video. And by subscribing you'll be the first to see all of our new spooky creepypasta stories. A very big thank you to Corpse Child for allowing me to narrate this awesome story. Make sure to check out their Reddit profile for more brilliant stories. And be sure to take a look at the playlist here for more of their stories that I may have already narrated. I would just like to say a very big thank you to all of the authors that I have worked with and all the ones that I will work with in the future. So thank you all my brothers and sisters. And why not hashtag cryptids roost in your comments. A quick thank you to all of my cryptids roost community family too. We are now well on our journey to 1000 subscribers. So please spread the word and help us to grow and expand. And don't forget to share the videos too. If you would like to throw me a dollar or three, I'd be very much appreciative. I do have PayPal, paypal.me slash cryptidsroost. Alternatively, I have an account at buymeacoffee.com. You don't even need to register on either site to donate. You can also follow us at my Facebook group, Twitter and Instagram. I also have Ko-Fi, BitChute and Rumble. I have a subreddit if you have a story you would like me to narrate for you. All relevant links will be below. 
and don't forget to check out the end screen, see above, that will also list some more videos in my back catalogue. Take care everyone and I hope you all have a wonderful and peaceful night. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. Ha 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 